theme actually isn't about the return of Christ, it's about two aspects of the church at Thessalonica. Why well, the context of first and second Thessalonians is of the return of Christ. So we will be touching to some extent, fairly limited I trust on that. I was at a GP during the week. He's a GP who special, specialises in pain management. So I spoke to him about the enabling grace of God being the key to manage pain. In the end I let him get a few medical words in and I went out to the reception to pay the bill which I knew I'd have to pay. In the cheek of him, he charged me for a long consultation. If I talk too long this morning, I think Rod might charge me again. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for the preciousness of your word. We thank you for the preciousness of our Saviour. May we get a fresh glimpse of him and how he have us to walk this morning. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Timer is on. Boasting about a church is the title of this message. And then I put a rhetorical question, what would Paul write about living hope? Well, you can answer that in relation to yourself. Colossians 4, 6 tells us that these letters of Paul were meant to be shared amongst the churches by email, by text, by Twitter, or maybe by donkey mail as we call it. But it wasn't just written to Thessalonians, it was meant to be shared abroad. And the Thessalonian church was a persecuted church, and we've read just recently from Nathan about that. Now people asked him about the persecution, and the Christian who was being persecuted but baffled and said, God is good. And so the Thessalonians knew that. Second Thessalonians 1, the church was founded about AD 53, 54, and you can see that in Acts 17, 1 to 9. Paul was there for about three weeks and reasoned in the synagogue. Many Jews believed, but many others were opposed and created a riot. Many Gentiles also believed, but because of the riot, Paul had to go to Berea. The time difference between 1st and 2nd Thessalonians is probably only about six months. These people are about one year into faith's journey, and yet Paul teaches them the complexities about the return of Christ, even in judgment and the events of the book of Revelation. Many times today we hear that it's too difficult, too hard, just don't bother about it. But he was Paul in his very early, earliest letter and to fairly new Christians teaching them about the return of Christ. The Thessalonians were a wonderful church. Paul writes about him in the first letter and he repeats a lot of it in the second letter. They were very enthusiastic about the return of Christ. In fact, so enthusiastic they decided not to go to work anymore because it wasn't needed and Paul had to instruct them you need to go to work and keep on doing what you are doing. Because they were doing a great job and the gospel was going out from the church there to all the other churches round about them. And it would appear that someone had written them possibly a letter telling them that they had gone into that period of time. They would missed the upward call of God in Christ Jesus as Paul refers to it in Philippians 3. And hence they were under a lot of distress because Paul had told them about the terrible events that would take place thereafter. And so Paul tells them, I have written this letter with my own hand so they would know that it was coming directly from him. I grew up hearing this message of the return of Christ many times, but we went to church six o'clock not Sunday morning for the breaking of bread service all day Sunday. We went to church Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday night, all day Saturday. Easter for four days, constant church. It was legalistic, yes, and it did become a cult. But I treasure those times of studying God's word, in particular in relation to the return of Christ. 
I don't want to embarrass Norma, but it used to be greatly preached about the return of Christ and the danger of being left behind. And that was instrumental in her giving her life to the Lord Jesus Christ. She can tell the story about that. I won't embarrass her. I wouldn't do anything like that, would I, dear? <laughs> let's go to the second chapter of Thessalonians, just to be different, and let's find out something of what they were worried about. And it's a very real worry that they were facing. They'd missed out on the call to be with the Lord Jesus Christ forever in heaven, as Paul wrote about in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. And Paul had told them that God had not appointed them to wrath, but through salvation in Jesus Christ. And now he's writing to them again about the things that he taught them. I just want to go through some of this terminology. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you. There's a term we call it modern days, the rapture, the catching up of the saints, or so flipping through the upper call of God in Christ Jesus. He says, not to be seen shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ or the day of the Lord had come. The day of Christ is the upcalling of the saints. The day of the Lord speaks about that period of time prior to him coming back physically to earth in judgment. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. So that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. The falling away comes from the Greek word apostasia, meaning apostasy. It also means departure, and some saw that as a reference to the rapture, but it's not. In Acts 20, Paul gathers the elders together and says to them, Shepherd the flock of God for grievous wolves. This is a nice term, isn't it? Grievous wolves will come in among you, some from within the church and some from without. So this falling away of departure from the truth was evident even in Paul's early day of writing. It's full, the Bible is full of warnings that in the last days there will be those who won't abide by sound doctrine. I don't know how many references there are, but there are very many. And so we need to be on guard always to be abiding by sound doctrine. In the modern day of the church there are examples in Europe. Once the bastion of Christianity, there's so few going to church these days. In Africa it's very different. So many are coming to faith in Christ. We have homosexual priests appointed as, despite the fact that the word of God is clear that it's an abomination. There are other things we could mention, but I don't want to go into this in detail. The terrible sexual abuse of children in the church that's so heartbreaking, having spent much of my life dealing, working with young children. There is a falling away. I'd love to be able to say that there'll be great revival and great evangelism before the Lord returns for the church, but I can't see it. The good news is, though, that the church will be presented to Christ the Bridegroom as blameless, without spot or blemish or any such thing, and God will bring that about. The key message for us, let us abide by sound doctrine. The man of sin speaks about the Antichrist. There will be many Antichrists, we are told, but this is the Antichrist. And there will be a triune evil men, one a political world leader, one a religious totally apostate world leader, sitting in a temple in Jerusalem. If you want to find out about that, Google the word Temple Institute and you'll find the Jewish people are ready to build it as soon as that time is appointed. Then he goes on to speak, Do not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things. There's a loving and yet a gentle rebuke. Remember the teaching that I taught you when I was with you in Acts 17. And now you know what is restraining that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness already is at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Another strange term it would seem. The restrainer is the Holy Spirit of God, but the Holy Spirit of God indwelling every believer. When every believer is caught up to be of the Lord in the air, the Holy, work of the Holy Spirit through believers will cease here on earth. The Holy Spirit, it said, is taken out of the way. 
he will still be on earth working to convict men of sin. But there are things that we can do in relation to RI. There was a petition recently about Canberra, about the banning of RI in schools in Canberra, and we could add our name to a list. We can write letters to politicians about these evil abortion laws that are being brought in. We can live our lives the way our testimony, our witness is, is restraining the work of the devil as he attempts to bring things in. Sure, you write letters and you'll get a normal reply just brushing you aside. But if only we all, every Christian in Australia, write letters to these politicians, I think it would make a difference. But I can't point a finger at anyone because I was guilty of not doing it for many years myself. And so that's the meaning of the term, he who restrains. And let us do it now while there is still time. The good news is that in that time, there will be the greatest revival this world has ever seen. Revelation 7, it speaks about a multitude that cannot be numbered out of every tribe and tongue and nation. And the question is posed, who are these? The answer is, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes white in the blood of the Lamb. They are martyred saints, persecuted saints, who have lost their life because of their belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. A great multitude that cannot be numbered. Going on, then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders. And you read about that throughout the book of Revelation. Not the easiest one to understand, but the key is study and know the Old Testament prophecies relating to them. Then there's a very solemn verse. It goes on to say, And of all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned, who did not believe the truth, but had no pleasure in unrighteousness. Many commentators believe that those who have heard the gospel and willfully rejected God's offer of salvation, when we are taken out, they will not have the opportunity of joining those number who come to faith in Christ during that so-called great tribulation period. And so the message for us, as I have loved ones, friends and family, is to be sure we share the message of salvation because we long to see them come to faith in Christ and spend eternity with them. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Now is the acceptable time. That is only a very brief overview of events. You can read right the way through from chapter 4 of Revelation to about 19. And these events will unfold and culminate with the return of Christ to the Mount of Olives. And we will be coming with him as we see, as we go back to chapter 1. John has read chapter 1, it's entitled God's Final Judgment in Glory, but Comfort in Persecutions. We aren't being persecuted here in Australia yet, but maybe if you think this doesn't apply to you, just think about the trials and tribulations we are going through in life, and there are very many, there's very many in this church. James 1, 2 to 3 in verse 12 says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials and various kinds, or trials or temptations, much the same in Greek. For you know that the testing of your, your faith produces steadfastness. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. And so let us endure as we go through these trials of health, as we go through tribulations in life, because it is work, God is working in us. What we are doing now is a preparation for eternity, and he will reward us in that day. What is the characteristic then of first of the church in Thessalonica? We read, we are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as is fitting, because your faith grows exceedingly. There's number one. 
your faith grows exceedingly. As we go through life, even in the trials and tribulations, sometimes we just feel like giving up. It's human nature. But God is allowing us to go through these experiences and he is there right beside us every step of the way and he will reward us. But it strengthens our faith as you realise and experience the fact that the Lord never leaves you and he is with you always. And if our faith is to grow exceedingly, we need to gather together to remember the Lord. We need to study his word. Hebrews speaks about some who have forsaken the assembling of the tales together. It doesn't matter how much I might preach or how much I might think I know, I need to sit under the ministry of the word just as much as anyone else so that my faith may grow and be strengthened. It is grown and strengthened through the Christian witness and testimony of my fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. May our faith here in Living Hope grow not just bit by bit, but with the help of the Lord may it grow exceedingly just as in Thessalonica. The second characteristic is the love of every one of you all abound toward each other. Not just the elders, not just the preachers, but the love of every one of you all abound towards each other. How strong is our love? If people come into this church and they don't know church, do they feel welcome? It's often being spoken about, and I know and I believe we are a welcoming church. That you can come in, someone will come and talk to you, say good day, that's so important. But may our love in everything, one to another. You talk about the return of Christ, there are all sorts of differences there. And I love to debate them with other so-called theologians, I'm not one. But it must be done in love. Let us not look down on each other because of differences of opinion, but rather love and respect each other. Have a judgment of what is right and wrong, yes, but abound towards them in love. And those are the two characteristics of this church, and that's why it was prospering, and that's why the gospel was going out in such a wonderful way, and that's why Paul writes them again to encourage, go back to what you are doing and doing so well. And the message for us this morning is to continue. Continue in your faith as it grows stronger and stronger day by day in your walk, walk with the Lord and continue in the love one for another. Praying earnestly for those who are unwell. Praying earnestly for those doing practical things. You see, it's no good me talking to someone about the return of Christ in the book of Revelation if they're sitting on a park bench and if they haven't had a feed for three days. That won't be the thing that will really grab their attention. If I took them to Macca's, maybe it might be better. Not necessarily for their health. Sorry to the men who went there yesterday. <laughs> but then it goes on to speak about the return of Christ, and I'm not going to go that into great detail. But it says that God will repay justly those who persecute you. There is a time coming when there will be a reparation for those who persecute the church. And he has promised to give us troubled rest. You can have that rest now in the midst of the trouble. But there is a glorious time coming when you see Jesus face to face. And you will be forever with the Lord. And you will know that perfect peace, that perfect love and that perfect rest. And it goes to say... And it speaks about the punishment of those. We think about hell as the lake of fire and suffering. But look what it actually says. It says they will be punished of everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. To me, that's the worst possible thing. Pain and torment's not good. I know a little, little bit about it but to be separated eternally from the loving Lord Jesus who died on the cross of Calvary. And they will have heard something of the gospel. And throughout eternity it will ring in their ears of what they could have had. And the day will come when men who persecuted that great multitude will literally see them returning with Christ. And it goes on to speak about when he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints. 
Imagine that Christ glorified in me. No, not possible. That's my immediate reaction. But we will have it happen in that day. And we will be glorified with him. In Romans 8, Paul says that the sufferings of this present day are not worthy to, worthy to be compared with the glory that will be revealed in us. And he is talking about the same time period. And it is because our testimony among you was believed. The preaching of Paul and Timothy was believed and it produced great results. Therefore we also pray always for you that our God will count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ might be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. What a wonderful day that's going to be for all who believe. Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ is your Saviour? I trust you do. In the second chapter, and in conclusion, it speaks about standing fast in what we are doing. It says, but we are, in verse 13, chapter 2, but we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth, to which he called you by our gospel, that is the gospel of Jesus Christ, for the attaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions, the things that Paul had taught, which you were taught, whether by word or our epistle. We will be counted worthy on that day, not because of the amount of endurance or patience we have, but because we have washed our robes red, washed our robes white in the blood of the Lamb, through the blood of Jesus shed on Calvary's cross. So let us stand fast. Ephesians 6 tells us that in putting on the whole armour of God and stand. So in everything we do, we must put our faith into action in practical ways, whether it's a caravan that Michael's been talking about, whatever it may be. And James tells us that faith without works is dead. Our faith must be seen in action. Colossians 3.17 we read, Whatever you do in word and deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And in verse 23, Whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. The glorious day is shortly coming when we shall see Jesus face to face. At the judgment seat of Christ, we shall receive those rewards for service. I trust we are waiting eagerly, and as Paul says in Romans 8, for his return. King James just says wait, but the Greek means to wait with eagerness and anticipation. I'm longing for that day when this body shall be changed like unto Christ's glorious body, and we shall be forever with the Lord. And he concludes, if now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God and Father, who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope by grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. And that is my prayer, and I trust it is our prayer this morning, that as we go ahead from here, we might be comforted, that we might be encouraged, to look for that glorious day when Christ appears and we shall be eternally in his presence. It is only a brief, very brief look at the context of those chapters, but I trust it will encourage us and urge us on in our Christian pathway this week and in whatever weeks are left for us here. Father, we thank you for that glorious promise that we shall see soon see Jesus face to face. The words of Jesus in John 14 says that I am coming again, that where I am you may be also. We long for that day, and yet help us to reach out in the community around us. We've heard of those who are grieving, and we commit them to you again this day. May we be able to demonstrate Christ's love to them and to all those around us. Just bless us and be with us as we depart, we pray. 
giving you thanks in Jesus' worthy and precious name. Amen. Amen. Jesus, what a beautiful name. Let's stand and sing it.